Yes, yes, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to The Blueprint, episode 8. I'm your host, A. Rich, Akeem Richens. You should know the saying by now. If you don't know me, get to know me. And today, I got a very, very special guest in the building. Phone interview with my brother, my Buffalo Fanatics brother, Kevin Gerard. How you doing, bro? No bad, buddy. Thanks for having me. Yes, sir. Yes, sir, man. I, I felt it was necessary for me to have you on the show because... You are Miami Dolphins fan, so you give a, a, a interesting take and an interesting assessment coming from a, a outsider's point of view. So I'm gonna get right into it. How do you feel about what our or what my Buffalo Bills did this off season, and what you think about the Sean McDermott and Brandon Bean era thus far? So far, they've done. Uh, I think they've done a really good job. Obviously, um, the this off season in particular. Uh, you guys kind of sat back, uh, you identified your glaring weaknesses, and for the most part, you've uh, done your best to address them. Um, what I really like is the focus on the offensive line. Um, obviously, through both the draft and the free agents additions, you've brought in, I believe, like eight new offensive linemen. Um, so the regardless of how it shakes out with the, uh, with the starting lineup, you're going to have very good quality depth all along the line, yep. so one injury won't derail the this, this season. Um, you brought in a couple of nice, couple of complimentary receivers that should help. Uh, one, you know, in John Brown that stretched the field. And the no, 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 Kev, Kev, let, let, me, let me cut you off right quick, Kev. You said a couple, sure. you said a couple of complimentary receivers, so you don't think there are, they are go-to guys or number one guys, those are role players at best? Yeah, absolutely. They're role players, so. Your number one guy, in my opinion, is uh, Foster. I'm very high on Foster. Um, I know it was a limited uh, sample that we had last year, but uh, his physical skill set, um, to me, that he, he's your best chance of developing into a number one receiver. I haven't quite given up on Zay Jones yet either. He's got uh, nice. ton of ton of athletic potential. Um, I, I'd like to see him play with a bit more aggressiveness. Sometimes I find he's a little soft, but the potential's there. Beasley is never going to be a number one receiver. I don't think he's ever topped 800 yards. Um, he averaged the last couple of years, he's averaged less than 10 yards a catch. He's an underneath uh, move the change third down option. Right. Nice role player to have for sure. He's going to carve himself a nice niche within your, within your uh, wide receiver roster. But to be honest, I, I, I I don't see him on the field that much unless you're running four wide receiver sets because Zay Jones, I think, is best in the slot, and John Brown is going to be a nice deep threat. Hey, um, and, and, and as, I'm glad you mentioned John Brown because you, you said that Robert Forster may be the number one receiver on the team, but when we come out in two receiver sets, I see Zay Jones and John Brown as the starting receivers. I, to be honest, I, I think it will shake out as Foster and Brown. Um, and then I think Zay Jones comes in in three receiver sets. Wow. And then I think Cole Beasley's on the bench and he comes in on certain you know, certain uh, formations, and he'll come in when uh, on, on four receiver sets when you do run that spread because I hear that you're going to uh, try to address that particular offensive scheme a little bit to take advantage of Josh Allen's dual threat nature. Right, right. And hey, man, that's, that's an excellent analysis. I really respect your knowledge of the game. And I know I like to talk about uh, off air what we're going to get into before we get on. But since I respect your knowledge so much, I'm going to hit you with some things that you, you probably wasn't expecting, but I'm pretty sure you're prepared for it. Give me your thoughts on, on the New York Jets and what they did this offseason, being that they, they have your, your former head coach in Adam Gates. That's, uh, man, they're an enigma. Like, I, I just cannot understand how they let a GM go out and spend that much money, then have a draft, and it, which in my eyes was a very good draft. I really liked their draft. Right. And then fire him and, and then hire basically – Someone else who's kind of, in my eyes, you can tell me, you know, I can hear what they're trying to say, but it, to me it sounds like this guy is is uh, reporting kind of to Gase, that Gase is going to be the man calling the shots, right. and these guys, quote, work well together, but um, Gase, man, what an, what an enigma. Like, 
from a play calling perspective as a Dolphins fan, I just couldn't stand it last year. Actually, the last couple of years. Mm. If you think about it, this guy had three years in Miami. First year, 10-6. and six. In my eyes, he got robbed of coach of the year because Miami came out of nowhere, 10-6, and six, went on a playoff run, went to the playoffs. Right. Uh, T- Tannehill got hurt at the end of the year, so they basically went to the playoffs with Matt Moore, uh, lost to uh, Pittsburgh. Right. Um, and then the next year, Tannehill was hurt for the whole year, and he goes 6-10, and 10, pulling like a bum Jay Cutler out of the retirement. And, <laughs> and it, it doesn't matter how really good your starting quarterback is. I don't think there's any team in the league, uh, you know, maybe other than the Patriots with their system, but it, that it, that uh, will lose a starting quarterback and have a successful year. Right. So they went 6-10, six, six and ten, and then last year, they went seven and nine, uh, and again Tannehill was not a world beater, but he's very he's average, you know. And he, he missed like five six games, right. and we've had to play Brock Asweiler, and that oh man that guy's just terrible. Right. And we still ended up still ended up seven and nine. So I have a lot of um, confliction because, and no one would say that Miami is a very talented team. Right. So how did that team end up seven and nine? Right. I mean, if, if I have to think about it, I just think that if I have to put things in perspective about what happened in Miami last year, I think that Adam Gates just had too mu- uh, too much control of the team. I think I, I think yeah. he had too much control, and it took the focusness away from uh, what he's supposed to get done on the field. I think that the New York Jets, I actually like the hire of Adam Gates because he can just stick to football. He can just stick to what's going on on the football field. He doesn't have that control of the roster personnel. He doesn't have that control of cutting guys and trading guys anytime he gets mad or gets ready. So I really like him as a as a football coach as opposed to giving him so much control. So that's just how I feel about the whole Adam Gates situation. Yeah, I, I was on board with you there. I'm just curious now that the, uh, what's his name? McLock, McGack, what's his, the, old, the old GM there? McCagney, yep, McCagney. McCagney, yeah. And this new guy, I wonder how that dynamic is. Like, is at the end of the day, is Gase back in the driver's seat? Like, was that a power struggle that Gase won? And now he's got kind of um, control again? Like, I don't know. If right. he just coaches, I, I, I agree 100% with what you're saying. If he just coaches, he should be able to help Sam Darnold. Um, he should be able to, uh, you know, they, they have Le'Veon Bell. I think will probably struggle a bit as a runner because he'll be rusty and that offensive line's not too great. Right. But he's going to be a dynamic weapon for uh, for Darnold as out of the backfield. Nice, nice. All right, so let, let's let, let me let me do my impersonation of Molly Quam and switch gears, shift gears a little bit, shall we? Um, we've we 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 know that you are a Miami Dolphins fan. You are a Miami Dolphins guy. You've been a Miami Dolphins fan for a very long time. The new coach, uh, Brian Flores, is is the new uh, guy over there with the Dolphins. Tell me what you think about him. Give me your assessment on the coaching staff. And just break down your team, the Miami Dolphins, as a whole. So the new coaching staff, we have Brian Flores from the New England Patriots. Mm-hmm. The, they're giving him credit for the defensive game plan in the Super Bowl, which shut down the Rams. I don't know how much of that is him, how much is that is Belichick, so to be determined. Right. There's some natural skepticism because not no one so far has left uh, Belichick and actually really succeeded. But that was I'm correct. hoping this guy will be the first. Um, what I really liked about him is uh, he took Chad O'Shea, who was, going to, was the former wide receivers coach for the Patriots. He's going to be running the offense, so they're going to run that uh, New England style of offense, which I think think is my favorite offense in the league just based on scheme versatility right one game they're running 40 times the next game they're throwing it 40 times right the, who they play it dictates you know how they attack them so i i'm, I'm very uh excited for that whereas adam geese is this is my game plan try and stop me right these guys are i'm gonna see what you do poorly and exploit it right Jim Caldwell's been brought to the staff, former uh, head coach of uh, Detroit Lions and Indianapolis Colts, and he's going to be working with the uh, the quarterbacks. So, um, obviously, we acquired Josh Rosen in the offseason. Um, we got him for basically nothing. Right. Um, after all the draft maneuverings, 
we traded basically traded this year's second and next year's fifth for a next year's second and Josh Rosen. So the two sec- seconds kind of wipe each other out. Right. So we basically traded a fifth round pick for Josh Rosen. The Carolina uh, Arizona sorry has already paid all of uh, his guaranteed money. Right. So we have him for three years for a total of six million dollars. So he's costing us two million a year. Worst nice. case scenario, he's a very talented backup. But hopefully, with Caldwell and in this New England style offensive system, which is quick hitting, rhythm passing, um, the, a cerebral approach, if you will, that seems to fit uh, Rosen's profile. Now, uh, speaking on Rosen for a second, I want to ask you a question, or, or or maybe a possible concern about his game. We see Josh Allen game. He has some uh, pocket presence and some escapability. We see Sam Donald, who's not a runner, but he definitely has the pocket presence, presence and he can definitely escape when need be. We could say the same for uh, Baker Mayfield. We could say the same for Lamar Jackson. Josh Rosen, on the other hand, he seems like more of a, uh, to me at least, Drew Bledsoe. More of a statue in the pocket. I'm not. I'm not sure how much pocket presence he have and how much escapability he has. Are you? Do you have any concerns about uh, Josh Allen's movement in the pocket and escaping? I do this year because um, the offensive lines in shambles. Uh, we lost Josh Sitton, who retired our Pro Bowl guard. We lost Jajuan James, who was a right tackle. Denver paid like a ton of money for him. Um, so it's basically Laramie Tunsil and four, one rookie and then three bums. So oh, I am for this year, but I mean, we can, I, I see where you're going with the Drew Bledsoe comparison, but the high end, you know, would be a Tom Brady, Peyton Manning, uh, Drew Brees. None of those guys move, right? Right. Um, Philip Rivers, like, they, it, so it, the fact that he's so smart and the fact that he's able to uh, make quick decisions in the pocket, hopefully, once we get a, a bit more protection for him, he and he learns the offense well, he'll be able to uh, find those those guys pretty quickly. The one thing Miami does have is uh, the fastest skill players in the league by stopwatch. I'm not saying the best, right? But I'm saying the fastest. I mean, Jakeem Grant, Kenny Stills, Albert Wilson all run four threes. Devontae Parker runs a 4-4. The tight end, Gusecki, runs a 4-5. And, and uh, Kenyon Drake's uh, a 4-4 runner. Uh, like, every single guy on that offense is, a, is is fast. So, I mean, it doesn't translate into greatness, but hopefully they'll have the quickness to separate quickly, and he'll be able to find the open guy, much like a Tom Brady does, um, so that he doesn't get hit. That, and I, I, I definitely can see that posing mismatch nightmares. I don't, I'm not sure what Adam Gase was doing with Mike Jacecki Gis- last season. I seen him blocking a ton last season. I could be wrong, but he's an oh, athletic. You're right. <laughs> uh, he's an athletic freak of nature. He definitely needs to be on that receiving end. What's the deal with Devontae Parker, man? I loved him coming out of college. He doesn't seem to stay healthy. He seems to be get injured a lot. What's, what's, what's the deal with him? This guy is uh, Superman. And all pro, and then he gets a hangnail, and he can't play. <laughs> like it, it is, it is insane. And right. every single spring, this guy is dominating camp. He is the best player on the team, and we're all every year. We're like, this is the year. Mm-hmm. And then every year, nothing. Last year he came out. Uh, no, it was two years ago. He the first game he played with Jack, Jay Cutler. Ten catches, hundred eleven yards, touchdown. I'm like, oh man, this is it. He's put it together. He's going to the all pro. That touchdown was his only touchdown of the year. Like, right. he, he is mind, he is, it's mind boggling how frustrating he is. He, he kind of reminds me a bit in, in physical size and athleticism of a foster. Right. They're similar sizes, similar weights. They run similar speed. Um, like Parker's uh, very good in his rookie year. He was elevating to catch the ball, making a lot of contested catches. The problem is as soon as he lands, he's Mr. Glass and he breaks and then he's on, and then he's on the shelf for another five games. Right. Uh, he's, he's clearly the, the X factor of our offense. If he ever put it together and he ever plays to his potential, then you have that number one receiver and it transforms the whole offense because now you, you have someone that the defenses are going to game plan against and that should allow guys like Wilson and Stills and Grant to get open with their speed. 
Right. I think he's the main guy. I think he's I think he's definitely the X factor in that offense, Devontae Parker. He's the one guy you you named Jakeem Grant and Kenny Stills, but Devontae Parker is is the one guy that has the possibility of doing everything as a wide receiver, a do it all wide receiver. So we definitely gonna see uh what type of steps he takes in towards towards becoming that number one wide receiver. But quick question about the New England Patriots. Do you feel that uh, anybody else in the AFC East is going to dethrone them or is just going to be a, a, a retired Brady and a Belichick setting off in a sunset that has to, that has to happen before the New England Patriots take that step back? Man, if you'd asked me like five years ago, I would have said a different answer. But now I'm just so beaten down by these guys. <laughs> and, and keep in mind, Miami usually beats them every year. Right. Um, and we In Miami. Right. Uh, like, I think uh, Ryan Tannehill almost has a 500 record against these guys because almost every year he wins in Miami. Right. I mean, they're just so dominant. He, he Brady's just, with the new rules that allow these quarterbacks to extend their careers, he just knows that offense so well. He knows the system so well. It's really hard for me to see anyone beating them at least this year like if he, maybe he doesn't have to retire maybe he just has to have a significant drop off in play right but if he continues to play at the level he's playing it's going to take a it's going to take like a a crazy wild card win at new england to kind of knock them out and move on i think definitely man i could definitely see that as well i i'm to the point right now where i have to see it to believe it i have to see a team i have to see a jets a dolphins or a Bills team actually take the AFC East title. I cannot say one of those teams will take the title until I see it first. That's just that's just what it comes down to for me. Uh, oh, I agree. I don't even, like, no, I have to poke the corpse. I can't just see it. I got to <laughs> poke it to make sure it's dead before I'll ever believe it's gone. Like, definitely, man. Definitely. I, I feel the same way. I feel the same exact way. Uh um, more questions, man. I, like I said, I respect your knowledge of the game. I think that you have a, a, a you bring awesome analysis. So let me go ahead and, and take it a step further beyond our division. The Houston Texans, we all know they had our former uh, Buffalo Bills guy that's, as their GM in Brian Gain. They fired Brian Gain after, a couple of weeks after the draft. And I believe it was earlier today they said that they opted against hiring a GM for the season. I'm not sure exactly how, who's going to be running, uh, who's going to be managing the team in that retrospect, but how do you feel about the uh, an organization? I, th- I think it's unprecedented. I could be wrong, but how do you feel about an organization uh, going through a whole season without a general manager? Yeah, it's crazy. Like We've seen uh, situations before where the coach is both coach and GM, but they haven't given him that official title they're like talking about how he's going to work in concert with the director of scouting and the president. Wow. But I, I, I've never seen this before. The, the, Brian does, Gaines, who would the, the, like, the head coach, does the head coach uh, from the Houston, did he win enough? Does he win enough to give, give all that damn control to? I, I, in my mind, he's on one of the hottest seats in the league. Mm. With the talent that the Texans have, and their abysmal failure to address the offensive line time and time again, with Deshaun Watson, who in my mind is just a phenomenal quarterback, even at this early stage of his career. Right. With uh, Hopkins, with that defense, uh, how they haven't won more than they have, it's, it's to me, this guy has to be on the hot seat. I'm thinking if this guy doesn't win like 11 games and go to the, or at least win the division, he's getting fired. And then they turn around, he's basically almost like one third of an interim GM. That whole organization is in disarray i i don't understand what they're doing i it is baffling to me right and i i mean i could understand earlier in his in his coaching tenure with the houston texans he had some he had some injury bugs at quarterback i know they didn't have the stability that they wanted at the quarterback position and because of that that probably saved his job a little longer than we expected so now that deshaun watson's in the fold he tore his acl i believe that the houston texans as an organization, been having a bad, a bad string of luck with quarterbacks, and hence that saves Kelly Job, in my opinion. 
That's the reason now they, I believe they're looking for him to take off. They're looking for the team to take off. But it's just a real bizarre, bizarre situation with uh, a team not not having a, a GM. It's, it's really baffling. Really baffling. <clears throat> but um, moving on. Right before we go, man. Uh, the Blueprint of Buffalo Bills podcast for the fans. We spoke about a lot of different topics um, today with the Miami Dolphins or with Brian Gain, a little bit of Adam Gase with the Jets. I have to end it off with a question about the Buffalo Bills. So, Miami Dolphins fan, do the Buffalo Bills make the playoffs this year? Why or why not? They got a good shot. Um, I see them as a 9-7, 10-16. and 16. Uh, Obviously, everything hinges on Allen's development. Um, a lot of ups and downs, a lot of ups and downs. And if we have time, I got I have one question for you. Actually, I just thought of that. De- time, definitely, definitely. I got. Uh, e- e- everything depends on John. Your defense is is very solid. Um, and you have a uh, Milano's coming back from injury. Edmund should be better this year. Technically, uh, Wallace should be better this year as he's gotten more experience. Right. Uh, getting Taron Johnson back from injury, in my mind, is a huge uh, thing because I think he's vastly underrated. I think Milano is vastly underrated. Agreed. Having Ed Oliver hopefully get in there should, uh, should you know, you don't want to put too much expectations on a rookie, but um, he's got to get in there. He's got to produce. And, uh, have, you know, a top three safety tandem in the league. Uh, Trey White's a really good corner. Um, it'll be interesting to see how much McCoy's got left in the tank and if uh, Gore eats, how much he eats into those carries. But nice. uh, I think you're 9-7 to 10-6 team. I think if everything goes, I think worst case scenario, you're 8-8. Eight and eight, and Best case, you're 11-5. and five. I don't see you winning the division, but I, I definitely, definitely could see you uh, getting a wild card spot. Hey, man. There you have it. Kevin Gerard himself. The- Believes the Buffalo Bills can be nine and seven or ten and six. I definitely agree. I definitely feel that we can be a a, a strong nine and seven to ten and six team. When I say strong nine and seven, people are like, "Hey, Rich, what you mean?" I'm a strong nine and seven team, meaning uh, take care of what you have to take care of in the AFC. If we win the necessary games in the AFC, I think the rest will take care of itself. And if we have a strong AFC division or AFC record, I believe nine and seven will get to, get us in. But what question you had uh, for me before we get out of here? So, obviously the uh, the Bills fans are sky high on Josh Allen. And uh, I can see, understand why based on his physical capabilities. Plus, he ended the season on a really high note. He uh, had a really good game against the Dolphins, who were missing all four starting secondary members and kind of giving up on their coach. But gotcha. I like how you, that, I like how you maybe, threw that out there. I like that. <laughs> yeah, maybe, maybe that's being a little bitter, but I've got a question for you. I was curious, would your outlook, so game, week 17 was against Miami and he had the big game. Week 16 was against the Patriots. I don't know if you remember that. I do. I, I kind of asked Rico the same question, but he dodged. Um, so I'm curious, if you had swapped week 16 and 17, just like the order they played them in. And that game against the Patriots was the last game of the year. Would your enthusiasm for Allen be any different or would it remain the same? Because that game against the Patriots was rough. It was rough. Um, My enthusiasm would remain the same. The reason why is because at the end of the day, it is the New England Patriots. At the end of the day, I seen the New England Patriots win the Super Bowl, so they was the best team in the NFL. And Josh Allen's a rookie, and Bill Belichick does a great job in, in terms of schematics and getting his team prepared, especially against rookies. So I, I would still be upbeat about Josh Allen, but at the same time, we know he has a lot of things to work on. Um, the games he did look good, like the Miami Dolphins, like you said, he, I was missing uh, basically your whole start in secondary. The, the game against the Minnesota Vikings, Minnesota Vikings was... Uh, have a lot of a lot of a lot of turmoil going on with them that season when uh, we played the Vikings. I know he played well. He jumped over Anthony Barr, but when you look at the teams Josh Allen played well against, they had their own personal struggles. You look at the Detroit Lion game. Uh, it was it was multiple games where he looked good, but he looked good against teams that uh, wasn't 
contenders or wasn't playoff ready. So I'm excited to see how Josh Allen develops and plays when he has uh, w- uh, when he's facing a uh, better competition, playoff teams. So to be a playoff team, we have to beat and perform and play well against other playoff teams. So I want to see Josh Allen's uh, progression when it comes to the talent he's playing, and I want to see him be more accurate, deliver the football when he needs to deliver the football, and that's going to be all on his footwork and his mechanics. But do I think he could get it done? Yes, I think he could get it done. Am I being biased? Yes, I'm being biased. But shit, why not? It's it's my team, the Buffalo Bills. Good point. Yes, sir. Amen. Kevin Gerard, man, it was was excellent having you on. The Blueprint, Episode 8. Anything you want to say before you get out of here? No, man, just uh, if you don't know him, you got to get to know him. (laughs) Kevin Gerard, I appreciate that. Ladies and gentlemen, you've listened to The Blueprint, episode 8, with my co-host for the day, Kevin Gerard, Buffalo Fanatics. Uh, it's, It's been fun, Kev. It's been fun. Ladies and gentlemen, till next time. The podcast you just heard was made using Anchor. Ever thought about making your own podcast? Anchor makes it really easy for anyone to get started. It's a one-stop shop for recording, hosting, and distributing podcasts. Best of all, it's 100% free. Sign up now at anchor.fm slash new. That's anchor.fm slash new to get started.